What makes someone a codependent or cluster B personality? I touched on this a few times before in many earlier videos, but never one on its own, so I bring you this. As you can see, there's a lot on the table, but first I'd like to talk about what I've been doing on and off for the past year as it kind of relates to this topic. Building my family tree. Even going so far to purchase one of those DNA and health report kits. Discovered a lot of interesting things about my ancestry that I never knew about before. In the years prior, I long assumed my maternal heritage to be British Celtic with a touch of Polish, but as it turns out, Poland meant Pomerania, or more specifically the town of Volgost in northeast Germany. I also had a great-great-grandfather from New Jersey whose parents emigrated from the Rhineland. So all in all, my Irish and German roots are nearly split, 50-50. Guess that finally explains my longtime preference for Weihenstephana over Guinness, huh? The reason the Jersey ancestor was unknown to me until a few months ago was one, he died at a young age, and two, his grandson, or my maternal grandfather, was estranged from the family. When he was still alive, I probably talked to the guy once or twice over the phone, and it never seemed like he was well informed, let alone interested in his genealogy. The only person he knew about for sure was his other grandfather, who was born in New York during the Irish Famine. He too died young, leaving his working class father and five uncles under a single mother roof. Census documents and vital records only recount on so much in building the story. The most striking revelation of my research, however, was the large number of remarriages in the family, particularly among grandmothers and aunts. Whether this had to do with death or divorce of their husbands is irrelevant. Broken homes make perfect storms for abandonment issues, addictions, problems with authority, and most of all, people with personality disorders and those who enable them. Was I alive over a hundred years ago? Do I own a crystal ball or a time machine? Well, of course not, obviously. But vicious cycles from the past leave telling paper trails for the present and future. As far as my genetic health was concerned, the good outnumbered the bad, and there wasn't a lot to get bent out of shape about. Irregardless of what's wired into your genes, it's always practical to keep a moderate routine anyway, with indulgence kept at a minimum. Of utmost importance are the things you have the power to change. Without further ado, we shall start this commentary off with the codependent. The example presented today will cover the cluster C version, or the more anxious type, but I think we could all agree that there's varieties across the board. As a child, they begin as what's known as the identified patient, our scapegoat, and by default are the second-class citizens of the household. It's a status that often carries over into the schoolyard, in which their peer network will either consist of one or two close friends, or quietly following an entourage that might not even know they're there. For that matter, bullies may not be aware of their presence either too obscure to be ostracized. Back home, they get blamed or guilt-tripped for things they didn't do, receive unwanted or worthless gifts from the morbid parent as emotional insurance, and any noble deed or triumph is met with apathy or insolence along the lines of, your best is never good enough, or you should have done that anyway. But littling and emotional abuse will also be common, adding insult to injury, the narcissist running the show might call the kid ungrateful or even a narcissist. The reason they don't actually grow up to become one works like reverse psychology. Ethics and accountability are instilled like military drills, to the extent that any mistake carries hefty consequences. Miss a spot after sweeping the porch, a little late for school beyond your control, or not being generous enough to your do-nothing-wrong sibling? Then prepare for pushback and rage. What's created in turn is a hypervigilant, empathy-starved individual who not only finds their own needs on the back burner, but holds the raw deal as a means to an end. And through a process known as parentification, showing compassion towards others is the only way they'll feel it back. First example, vanity pushing. <laughs> So I just got this new sundress from Nordstrom, and I'm trying to emulate a young Meryl Streep. Fashion expert needed. How do I look, dears? Next, empathy pandering. Your father and I got into an argument again about finances and money. <laughs> Give me a hug. Tell me you love me. Tell me that I've been a good mother to you. Yeah, well, how about my needs? How about quizzing me on the math final I have for tomorrow? All you have to do is read questions off index cards. That's all I ask for. Can't you say I'm sick in bed right now? Something's clogging my sinus, and I'm in too much pain to talk. Wait till your dad gets home from work at 11 tonight. I'm not feeling too good myself. I think I'm coming down with the flu. What am I supposed to do about that? Stop what I'm doing and drive you to the damn hospital? Go to bed early. Quit being a baby. I think you'll live. Or how about some thug at school keeps trying to start fights with me for no reason and this faculty is too PC to do anything about it. If I defend myself, I fear a tarnished disciplinary record. What's my recourse? Wow, wow, wow. Don't come to me with this cockamini. Ignore the other boy. Forgive him or try to make friends with him. Sounds like you don't have many to begin with. Not my fault. This high-maintenance, low-return environment is so impressionable that the whipping boy will resort to one or both things. 
He'll either beat back his natural personality, resort to avoidance, and forge an ultra-minimalist existence, or he'll find himself with problematic relationships on his guardian's spectrum. And if he has a son of his own with one of them, it's wash, rinse, repeat all over again. Yep, yep. I'll discuss what causes the other extremes and the reasons they seek out codependence towards the end. Depending on your research level, some information might be old, some new. I guess we'll just have to see when we get there. The next profile is the Level 1 Covert B, or what I call the Nero Narcissist. Although they share similar introverted traits with some codependence, the upbringing that shaped them is otherwise quite different. For the most part, this individual will have the core of their early needs met, but will fall short on the character building scale. Oftentimes, this is the only child household where one or both parents were away on business, and materialism and pop culture compensated for caregiving, almost serving like a babysitter. The lack of engagement might cause the child to drift into a fantasy world that not only constructs their coming of age, but mature identity. As an alternative to interpersonal relationships, for example, the female might call her cat or a Game of Thrones actor her boyfriend, while the male might revere a video game muse and watch addictive amounts of pornography. <coughs> while these attributes alone are much closer to being self-absorbed than downright narcissistic, they're not exactly intrusive to grown-up behavior, and the lack of healthy experience dealing with others might manifest in the form of passive aggression and coldness especially when they try to start real relationships and everything seems to crash and burn on the spot. Unfortunately, these disappointments are never countered with clarity and the other side is always to blame. Yes, rejection does happen to people. No, it's not fun. But something's rotten in Denmark if it's the same person all the time. Once in a while, we kind of have to check the compost in our own backyard as a matter of upkeep. You can't rely on a bit of honeysuckle or a tarp and assume the baggage will go unnoticed. In lieu of genuine betterment, anger in this level will compound. If they don't lash out on a specific group in one fell swoop, they'll create their own conspiratorial realities, which will only preserve their situations. Part of this is owed to the sheltered existence they were brought up in, but it also comes back to their parents' enabling, who likely rushed to the child's aid even when they were clearly in the wrong. Finally, if there's any intervention, pediatric health experts will likely classify the problem as ADD or autism rather than a result of lousy parenting. The lack of scientific evidence linking the first two conditions, among other things, has always been apparent. But needless to say, these issues don't get resolved so easily. The next spot on the diagram belongs to the nomadic narcissist. A nomad not in the sense of wanderlust, but because they've been to places with their manipulation and subterfuge and have many more miles to go. It's what their role model raised them with, after all. This, ladies and gentlemen, is when we get to the bona fide golden child. Although their upbringings are similar to the level ones, they're more outgoing and high-functioning and lack the violent impulses of the more extreme narcs. While they have little empathy for anyone other than themselves, they always need other people in some way to feel validated. On the surface, it might appear like they're well-liked and have a vast social network, but up close they go through and treat their following like household garbage bags. If there's any true confidants to be found, it's more than likely going to be their cluster B parent or vice versa, but even that relationship will be volatile. The high turnover of friends will no doubt lead to loneliness, and if they don't project it by mocking other people's private lives, they'll engage in one-upmanship about the dumbest things imaginable, like questioning or correcting nearly everything another person says, especially someone they perceive as being more intelligent. Nothing is left out of the equation. The tie that binds all of them, however, is an inferiority complex that isn't compatible with the world they live in. As the balance of my subscribers can agree, the most vocal of these golden children are the protected classes defined by the modern left. One could almost call it a large-scale model of the dysfunctional family. The child can do no wrong, they're infantilized, pedestalized, vindicated for their bad behavior, and reared to believe that all shortcomings are another side's fault. If it means getting what they want, they'll even turn on their own enablers at the drop of a hat and have no remorse about the trouble they cause to everyone. The oversized pink elephant doesn't get more obvious with this analogy, and yet in the same token, these cluster bees could be our very own philosophical soulmates, conservative or liberal be damned. Bottom line is, one should always be weary of political movements as a whole. They're hotbeds for narcs. I've seen it with my very own eyes. First as a white knight in shining armor, and until two years ago, a stalwart for the men's rights movement. Let's take a little break and talk about insincere egalitarianism. When I started this channel way, way back in late 2013, I was at a time of my life that could best be described as existential purgatory, red pill rage, if you will. I was working another dead-end job with more pipe dreams, had just gone back into dating after a self-imposed hiatus, and was still coming to terms with a rather jarring, deformative past. 
the course of making videos and talking to other content creators, I found that my crossroads mirrored others. Men who grew up under similar circumstances later ended up in turbulent relationships, lost everything in unfair divorce settlements, including child custody, or perhaps all the above. I truly believe that the majority of these guys were recipients of narcissistic abuse in some way, shape, or form. It could be said that the mostly female perpetrators, whether that meant a wife, girlfriend, or childhood guardian, were let off the hook. In addition, I don't think proper resources were available for help, especially with the counseling world being overrun by SJW abusers. In other words, no one and nowhere to turn to except the same rubber stampers of self-hatred. But there was a troubling trend with a few of these guys that I couldn't ignore, particularly some of the divorcee vloggers. The belief that family of origin stories shouldn't count has valid cases of wrongdoing, so don't bring them up. Which is putting the cart before the horse and getting to the root of the likely problem, unless of course both sides of the marriage were the narcissistic villains. I didn't want to believe this right off the bat, but as soon as I removed my bias goggles, the reality storm hit like a son of a bitch. It's certainly no fun to watch one's echo chamber go up in smoke, but for me I don't regret it one bit as it made me a better person. Perhaps it would do us all good to be a little more objective from now on, hmm? Nah, that's Matrix territory, heresy, the plantation of blue pills. There was a single YouTube commentary that made me second guess a lot of the individuals I once aligned myself with. One that still haunts me to this day in a situation that, sadly, might not be so unique. Someone will recall the video from mid-2014 by that expat living in Central Europe, evading the wrath of the family law industrial complex. No major complaints based on what I hear so far. But this is when the narrative became a game changer. He claimed he started a fresh life for himself abroad, new girlfriend and all, and also wrote off his teenage son back home. He didn't even have the decency of saving a care fund after his child turned 18, because in his mind, the former wife probably brainwashed the kid into hating him. Which I call cowardly and selfish. You sire this human being, you never asked to be born, you coldly dismissed him as a product of your ex, and with no further interest in him, you now fit the deadbeat dad caricature that media is always shoving down our throats. Does this guy epitomize all father's rights activists? Mm, probably not. But the internet is so faceless, there's no surefire way to separate the good apples from the bad. And as far as I'm concerned now, credibility has to be earned. Good faith alone just doesn't cut it. Before the author took his video down, what kind of response did it get in the comments section? Oh, your usual suspects of lunatic fringers not only commending the guy, but ranting about AWALTs, tradcons, and calling females in general, no specific individual, various obscenities. The reactions had very little to do with the video itself, and there was no concern expressed for the narrator's son whatsoever. Wouldn't surprise me if these harpies were adolescent boys who never even asked a woman out on a date. Indeed, when activists and identity movements don't police themselves, you often get the above. A cesspool so loud and redundant that the opposition can then use the pandemonium as a weapon. And anyone who stands up will be branded no different than said opposition. All because the enablers greenlit the abusers. During the first year of this channel's existence, it could be said that I too was guilty of standing idle and turning a blind eye. Please believe me when I say that I regret it now. Like I mentioned before, the videos I made up until 2015 were generally well received. Hundreds posted comments or sent me private messages telling me that they went through the same experiences and thanked me for offering insights. But other fans weren't open about why they liked the content. I kept inquiring if you didn't endure anything even remotely similar, what's the takeaway? I never got a straight answer, as that apparently never mattered. As long as these fellas were down with the cause and continued to grandstand and virtue signal, we should welcome them unconditionally. Screw ulterior motives. Well, one comment kind of let the cat out of the bag, pushing me to change my red pill prescription to a single dose of XR, and the rage was history. This fell around the same time that I discovered the concept known as narcissistic supply. Anyway, the response to my video went something like this. These poor bastards. I'm so happy I didn't go through the same experience as a kid. Yes! My mom and dad paid for my STEM degree, helped me with my mortgage, and I haven't made in the shade. Who cares if the AWOLT skanks won't cure my lifelong dry shaft? That's better than walking on a minefield. This Valentine's Day, I'm celebrating with Cheetos, peanut butter fudge, and manga binging. Lack of empathy? Check. Lack of self-awareness? Check. Exploiting other people's misfortune to try to mitigate their own personal failures? Check. Latent inferiority complex? Check. Need I go on? Gotta love those aha moments, right? As I alluded to before, the internet is anonymous, and I don't have a PSYD after my name for official clinical diagnosis, but in the cases above, <laughs> I think it's fair and reasonable enough to make conclusions. Back to the diagram. By the time we get to the level 3 covert bees, political activism is either used as a last resort or means nothing at all. These people play by their own rules and push the envelope just short of serious legal repercussions. 
stuff that can always lead to guilt in a courtroom like harassment, stalking, or vandalism of property. Calling them out for their evil won't do you any good. They'll either accuse the accuser of being the manipulator or gaslight the person to kingdom come. Unfortunately, a lot of this doesn't come until after they've already trapped the other individual into their world of deception and almost Elysian sexuality. The unfortunate recipient, if they ever came to their senses, realized that this wild and refined love was just a message of control. Their upbringings are conflicting and scattershot. Discipline will be inconsistent, extreme neglect and devaluation will complement pampering and idealization, and the absence of a parent, usually the father, will cause a lack of checks and balances in nearly all areas of judgment. You could have a good-natured conversation with someone like this one moment, and next thing you know, they come off as snappy and hateful. Was it something you said? Were they just in a bitchy mood that day? If this is a common occurrence, there's more to the picture than meets the eye. A loose mental switch at play, so no, it wasn't you. Sounds pretty black and white, doesn't it? Well, it is. Anyone heard of psychological splitting? Thought so. And it's the reason these same people raise their offspring in such a lopsided fashion. In the event they're giving jobs in middle management, you can be sure that they'll treat their hapless employees in a similar manner. While it could be said that the group still falls on the covert side, they do exhibit certain traits which cast doubt on their stealth streak, like screwing up with their ruse altogether. This is not something I would have picked up a few years ago, but take a look at the text message exchange on the screen right now. Obviously, the gal is the white font on black, and the guy is the black font on white. After reading it through, it might not seem that there's a whole lot to interpret at first. The key here is the last message. I've heard this so many times on my own front, I have to wonder whether I've involved myself with the same person over and over again. Some of you will recognize the personality disorder on the spot. The selfish, table-turning guilt trips are the hallmark. Funny thing is, moments like these were some of the most cordial of the relationship. It was all downhill from there. The final group is the Overt Cluster B, and I don't break them up because there's little to distinguish when it comes to how they were raised and the way they see action versus consequence. It would be a stretch to call them schoolyard bullies because they generally don't last long in that environment. More like three hots and a cot before 18. Whereas the prior levels can blend into everyday life and society, the overts lack subtlety of any kind unless they wear a convincing mask. But that's not going to hide all red flags. The pervasive neglect they likely experience as a child pushes them to lie, cheat, and steal as an everyday survival tool. Anger from the long-term emotional and physical abuse will make them potentially violent, even the smallest triggers. And when it comes to the comforts they use to quell their pain, people have the same face value as drugs or alcohol. In describing the number of individuals they slept with versus those they scammed or did in, the tone of voice will never sound off. The dead giveaway is always the flattened effect or one-dimensional moods. Look for it. It's been mentioned before that the codependent welcomes them with open arms due to the traumatic bonding of their own upbringing. They were raised to bend over backwards for their cluster B parent, and now they're doing the same for their adult relationship. But the peer bonding works in the opposite capacity for the cluster B other half, who lacked a nurturing, stable guardian as a child and now finds solace in the submissive codependent. This is what gave me the realization in improving my own relationships. The mere thought of each side playing the parent role is buzzkill, degenerate, perverse, especially with someone potentially dangerous. To quote a radio counselor, a match made in hell. It should also be worthy to point out that before the cluster bees settle for codependence, they generally seek out each other first. The wounded soulmate factor is certainly one reason for this, but both sides are also willing to go the extra mile just to meet the other's needs. As a case in point, there's a phrase often thrown around known as riding the carousel of the sexual marketplace. It seems to refer to women more than men, and while the term is supported by plenty of merit, there's psychological overtones that don't get a fair amount of discussion. With all the ruminations about why the nice gal supposedly goes for the bad guy first, why does the nice guy always find himself with the bad gal? Why doesn't either side take a genuine cue from their experiences as soon as they get hurt? When you get down to business, what makes you think that the nice clusters are really as innocent as they're cut out to be? Is the ambivalence showing through yet? If so, come join me on the fence. Plenty of room for all here. Now I'm aware there's potential shades of gray between each level on this diagram, and other conditions can co-occur. I put it together with all of this in mind. And I'm sure a few people might listen to the last part and think, wait a second, I had a really rough childhood. I was abandoned, beaten, called every name under the sun, and things turned out just fine for me. I never became a ruthless sociopath. By and large, this is contingent upon two things money can't buy, the most valuable assets anyone can have. 
one intelligence and the other self-awareness. So if this was your situation, allow me to give you a digital pat on the back, because it doesn't work this way for everyone, or at least those who had it as bad as you did. In truth, though, the ability to acknowledge a personal hardship could be the one-stop cure to any of these levels. Wanting to better yourself is a start, of course, but there's a challenging prerequisite in addition to licking one's wounds, and that's recognizing your personality flaws. Since tackling a weakness is often conflated with being one, not everyone is up and ready to go this route, and trust me, I don't blame them one bit. But while self-deprecation is one way of looking at the picture, there's others that make it seem less so. I think we could all agree that nobody's perfect. I mean, we make strides to be, but deep down we realize that such attempts were just, well, honest attempts. But imagine the people who truly believe they embody perfection. They may not claim it outright, but they certainly carry themselves in such a manner that any trace of humility seems impossible. Regardless of their true intentions, what do you think is the best course of action in putting someone like this in their rightful place? Trying to look more superior? Or simply ridding yourself of negative baggage while not doing anything in the way of proving yourself? If you take time to really think about it, the first choice is two people wrestling each other while balls and chains are clamped to their legs. To me, this is like watching a couple of prisoners spar in a gladiator match. What should it matter to either side who wins? The second choice is someone who learned to pick the lock on the restraint and then walk away. As the shackled fighter claimed default victory, mocked their opponent and jumped for joy, the ball and chain then drag them down to the bottom of the ocean. Lest we forget, this comes down to much more than just wanting to remove the leg gear, and you can't pretend like it's not there. It's about literally cracking that lock, and as long as you hold on to it, you'll always be in the same rink as the other fighter. You don't even have to know who the other person is. Let that sink in. For most, the moral of this concept will make perfect sense and turn a bitter pill into a blessing in disguise. Others, however, will be so welded to their self-consuming dogmas that the metaphor will come off as threatening, unless they try to rebrand it to suit their standards. I remember this rather well on the former version of my channel. The ball and chain represents traditional gynocentrism. I've never had to deal with it, so I don't have any negative traits. I also don't fall anywhere on your stupid chart. Case closed. The end. If this element still watches my videos, which will probably reflect in the downvote trolling, I say godspeed and happy trails, and with warm intentions. I'm sure such deep platitudes will take one to high plateaus. For everyone else, start building your online family tree. If you've raised the cross and garlic to a former spouse or your kinship of origin, there does run the certain risk of unwanted contact, but the better likelihood is distant cousins. Whether or not you stay in touch with them, I think you'll learn a lot of valuable, even life-changing information. Good luck and be well. Like, subscribe, comment, share, contribute to my Patreon to keep these videos going, and take it easy.